The first Corinthians, the 16th chapter. And I'm going to be reading from verses 8 and verse number 9. This morning, um, our reading is coming from the English Standard Version of the, of the Bible. Here's what the word says. It says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. I'm going to read that last part. And there are many adversaries. Father, your word is powerful. Your word will never change. It stands firm through the test of time. Your word is not just words. You are your word. So as we dig into your word today, we are digging into you. We are diving into you. So Father, we pray that through the word this morning, you would minister to our hearts. You would fill us up till we overflow. We thank you in advance for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, church, I want to talk to you from the subject, when God opens a door. When God opens a door. Have you ever uh, lived or had a moment in life where you knew God opened a door for you? You knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that you were living and walking in the blessing of God, and it was nothing else but the hand and the work of God in your life. Now, I want to talk to you about a door uh, and God opening doors, but I want to talk to you. I want to, I, if I could, I would put the adjective in front of the word door, a great door or a, any, uh, an effective door, a door that's wide open as we read here in the passage. See, every great door that God opens in your life will advance the kingdom agenda. Did you hear that? Every great door that God opens in your life, it does this. It advances God's agenda. So when I talk about a great door and God opening a door for you, I am not talking about just an opportunity. I'm not just talking about you got an opportunity for a job, and I'm not saying God isn't in that. But when I talk about a great door, a wide open door, it is an opportunity for you to move the kingdom of God forward with your life. Now, Whenever God opens a great door into it opens a great door before you, here are two things that you will that will automatically be attracted to your life. Here you go. You ready? Here's the here's the focus today. There are two things that come with every great door that God opens in your life. The first is distraction and the second is opposition. The first is distraction and the second is opposition. The opposition we find, we can find in the passage we just read, that opposition would be fine in the, in the second verse, verse 9, where it says, uh, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. There are adversaries. There are those who oppose the work. But in order to see the distraction in the, in the passage, you have to understand what's going on in this particular story or in this particular letter. The Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Corinthians. And the book of Corinthians is a letter to a church at a place called Corinth. Hence the name of the book, Corinthians. The Apostle Paul, again, is the writer. And in the passage that we read, he is writing a letter to a church in Corinth. This is a church that he founded and also serves as a spiritual father or leader or mentor to. Now, his letter to the Corinthians is a response to a letter that they sent him. And in that letter, they expressed to, to Paul their desire for him to return to Corinthians. Now, Paul is in Ephesus, but they're saying, we need for you to come to Corinth as soon as possible. They said, you got to get here because there are people who are disparaging your name. There are people who are taking your, t your teachings and the doctrines that you have taught us, and they are twisting them and manipulating them. And Paul, they are causing trouble in the church. So Paul, we need you to get back as soon as you can. 
See, the Corinthians were right to say this because these things were actually happening in the church. But despite their request, Paul decides to remain in Ephesus because a great wide door had been opened for him for effective ministry. And since God had provided a significant opening for the gospel to go forth, Paul was willing to trust him and to be faithful no matter the distractions or the opposition that he faced. So let's get into these two things. There are two things that come with every great door that God opens for you. And the first is distraction. Now, what is a distraction? Distraction is shifting our attention from something of greater importance to something of lesser importance. See, it doesn't mean that the thing isn't important. It just means that it has lesser importance. And when you're distracted, you'll take what should be a priority and you'll minimize the importance of that and you'll maximize the importance of something that really, while it may be a cause that needs to be focused on, it isn't the most important thing in your life. Are you regularly distracted by something? I don't know about you, I can easily get distracted. But if you're regularly distracted by something, here's something to consider. Our attention often runs to what's most important to us. Let's say that again. Our attention often runs to the things that are most important to us. So here's, here's what a distraction can reveal. A distraction can reveal what we truly love and what we truly worship. I'm not talking to anybody now. Distractions reveal, and our, our, rather I should say, our willingness to pursue distractions or to allow them to come in and set us off course, reveal what we truly love and what we truly worship. You see, one of the ways the enemy brings distraction into the lives of believers is through the, the ugly habit of people pleasing. Anybody ever been a people pleaser? Any may, anybody ever make decisions to keep everybody else happy? Anyone work yourself to death trying to make sure everybody else was happy? Come on, y'all. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I know it's, oh, I'm not a people pleaser. No, I would venture to say that all of us at some point in our lives struggle with this thing, this ugly habit called people pleasing. Now, here's a few things you need to know about people pleasing. People pleasing is an idol. People-pleasing is an idol because it literally puts people in the place of God. When we're, when we're, when we're busy willing to, to please people, we will turn our face from a, something that is more important for something that is less important. And the Bible that literally tells us to not be man-pleasers. It tells us not to people-please, but to in everything that we do, let it be done as unto the Lord. So I'm not doing this because it's going to make you happy. I'm doing this because God is honored when I do it. Here's the next thing with people pleasing. People pleasing is a heavy burden to carry. It's really heavy to carry when you're having to keep everybody else happy, especially in this context when God is calling your life in this direction, but people are calling your life in that direction. And now you're in this tug of war between the will of God for your life and pleasing people that you love. And all of a sudden now, now, now your life becomes heavy laden, heavy burdened because people pleasing is heavy. And here, here's the last one. Here's the last one. People pleasing slowly wears you out. You ever been ple people pleasing so long that you finally lose your mind? <laughs> You ever like, I mean, totally lose it. My God, I'm about to choke somebody. You start saying things you never said before. You didn't even know you knew those cuss words. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody. You didn't realize you could be so vile in your heart. But what's happened is you've lived so long in this space of pleasing people at the expense of your own relationship with God. And the challenge with people pleasing, and like I said, it's a slow process of wearing you out. You don't even know you've been worn out until you act out. How many of you have ever been there? I didn't know I was wore out until I acted out. And then when I acted out, I realized that I was wore out. 
Hopefully you learned your lesson and now you can actually, you can detect when you're getting to the edge. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody have learn how to steal away and just go and spend some time by yourself so you don't go back to those old ugly habits? All right, let me keep going on from people pleasing. <laughs> See, one of the reasons why we get trapped into people pleasing is, be, is because we don't know how to discern the difference between what is a good thing and what is a God thing. See, people will present a million good causes to you, but it's important to remember that a good cause isn't necessarily a God cause. Now check this out. Not every person coming to pull from your life has the wrong motive, but they may have chosen the wrong moment. I'm going to say that again. Not every person coming to your life and needing your help and wanting you to do something necessarily has the wrong motive, but oftentimes they are trapped in the wrong moment. And they're expecting you to step outside of something you've been assigned by God to do in order to meet them where, wherever they need and whatever situation they may be dealing with. So I'm not saying that there aren't good causes and there aren't people who need help and there aren't people that need or, or there aren't matters that need to be addressed. But what we have to do is be able to discern the timing of a matter. Sometimes what's important now isn't isn't what you think is most important. And if you allow people to govern what's important in your life, you're probably going to become a people pleaser. You'll probably spend most of your life torn between what it is that God is calling you to do and what other people are asking you to do. See, it's easy to believe that because you're doing a good thing, that it's the right thing. Did y'all hear what I said? It's easy to believe that because you're doing a good thing, that a good thing is a right thing. I know you're making this thing, it's a good thing. Why isn't it the right thing? No, no, it's a good thing, but it might have the wrong timing. The timing might not be right. The, the, as a matter of fact, maybe God doesn't want you to be doing it. Maybe God wants that person to have to endure that season through faith. I'm not preaching to anybody. I think sometimes we think that we put a big old S on our chest, Superman, Superwoman, Super God, and we're going to go out and try to do the work of God for him. Are you hearing me, somebody? I, I'm gonna, I think I can handle it for him. And the reality is God's like, listen, it's the right cause. It's just the wrong person trying to live out the cause. And what you're not doing is you're not giving that person an opportunity to be able to put their trust in me. They're trusting in you. And the trouble with them trusting in you is you're, you're bound to fail them. You see, the moment you get free from people pleasing is the moment you realize that you don't have enough to keep people pleased. And that you, and instead of pointing them to you, you begin to point people to Jesus who can do everything that you cannot do for their life. Are y'all with me? Check this out. See, it's easy to believe that when you're doing a good thing, you're doing the right thing. And that when you're helping everybody, that's the right thing. The truth is, anytime, even in good causes, anytime we shift our attention from something of greater importance to something of lesser importance, we're being distracted. Are you hearing me, somebody? Anytime I take something of lesser importance and lift it up to greater importance, guess what? I've been distracted. I've been distracted. And I think one of the things the enemy loves to do when God gives us an assignment is to, uh, is to distract us with things that are of lesser importance. And again, church, I didn't say they weren't good causes. I didn't say the people in your life aren't good people. I didn't say they, 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 that, that, that what they need is not actually a need. We didn't say any of that. What we said is we have to be able to discern whether or not we're supposed to be acting on whatever that cause is. And that's exactly the dilemma that the Apostle Paul is dealing with. The church in Corinth wants him to go back and fix the problems. And it's, it's a worthy cause. The church needed to be reordered. The church needed to have some correction. There were some problems and things that were arising in the church. But Paul has to choose between pleasing the Corinthians and pleasing God. Are you with me, somebody? See, it's, there, there will be crossroads, moments in your life as a believer where you'll have to choose between pleasing God and pleasing your family. Pleasing God and pleasing your friends. Pleasing God and pleasing your co-workers. Pleasing God and even pleasing church folks. 
I'm preaching real good now. And you have to discern the moment. And well, how do I discern the moment? Well, understand this. God's, God's opinion is the only opinion that matters. I, I hope somebody gets free with that. God's opinion, God's thought on the matter is the only one that matters. And if God has opened a great door for you in Ephesus, don't you dare go back to Corinthians. To Corinth, I should say. If he's opened the door here, there's no doubt about it. God wants you to walk in this door. God wants you to exercise your faith in this place. And he wants you to let him be God in those other situations. Again, the first of the two challenges that come when God opens a door in our life is distraction. I want to encourage you, don't let the enemy distract you from the purpose and plan of God for your life. And I'll say this. Oftentimes, distractions are wrapped in people you love. <laughs> oh, that always is getting tight in somebody's house right now. Because you might be sitting next to a distraction. You might be sitting next to someone who wants you to pull away from a moment God has brought you to in order to appease their emotions. And you have to decide, I will not be distracted this door is too amazing for me to give up here. Let me keep going on. Uh, uh, we move from, from distraction. The second thing that comes and appears in our lives when God opens a door is opposition. Opposition. Here, here's a little definition of opposition. Opposition. One that contends with, opposes, or resists. That's Opposition. Something is contending against you. Something is opposing you. Something is resisting you, trying to keep you from doing what it is that God has called you to do. Understand this. Every time God opens a great door in your life, opposition is coming. Did you hear that, somebody? Don't get on your knees and ask God to open a great door and not expect trouble to come along with it. Lord, bless me. May his favor be upon me, my family, for a thousand generations. You know what you just said? For a thousand generations, you're going to be fighting something. For a thousand generations, there's going to be beef. For a thousand generations, something is going to oppose you. Because whenever God opens up a great door for you to do effective ministry, for you to move his kingdom forward, you know what the forces of darkness do? They say, we got to find a way to distract and to oppose what it is that God is getting ready to do through Alex's life, what he's getting ready to do through Jasmine's life. The enemy says, we've got to do something to stir up something so they don't go forward through that door because if they happen to go through that door, they may just shake up their world. I wish somebody would hear me this morning. You are fighting the fight you're fighting because God has opened a door for you. Can I, uh, help me. The name Satan means adversary. The enemy of your soul, the name Satan literally means adversary. He is committed to opposing God, his people, especially when God's people are zealous to exalt God's glory. When you are ready to make your life a living instrument, a living offering as unto the Lord, and when it's all about God and not about you, I'm telling you, Satan and all of his friends are coming after you because if you would, I think we don't really understand the power of a surrendered life. When you surrender your life to the king, when you surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus, when you say, God, I'm all in with you, you don't understand. You become armed and dangerous. You become a, an effective weapon for the kingdom of God. Satan knows about it, and he wants to do everything that he can to keep you from walking in that truth. His very name means I'm going to oppose God, and I'm going to oppose God by opposing you. See, when you walk through a God-ordained door, don't be surprised by opposition. Can I say that again, church? 
when you walk through a God-ordained door, when you know this is God's moving in my life because God is about to get all the glory in this, understand this, that on the other side of the door, there is going to be opposition. As a matter of fact, the devil won't wait until you walk through the door. The devil will stand out in front of the door and try to keep you from even going in. How many of you have had that kind of a spiritual battle in your life? But how many of you know that when you fight that battle and you finally cross over into that door, the glory that's revealed on the other side of the fight is greater than anything you could have ever expected? If you believe that, why don't you go ahead and give God 10 seconds of your best praise and worship? Don't be surprised by opposition when a great door opens. 1 Peter 4 and 12 says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Can I just say this? If you're going to follow God into those great doors, you've got to become used to warfare. You've got to become well acquainted with warfare. There is a battle for this stuff. It just, the devil ain't just going to let you take whatever you want. He's going to fight you for it. But I want to remind you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's a power in you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you. Let church, let you be reminded this morning that yes, there is warfare, but there's also victory in Christ. We've got to become acquainted with, welfare, with, with warfare. We have to be reminded that, 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 that this, here, here's the next one, that opposition is proof of your calling. <laughs> you, wanna, you, wanna, you want some proof that God called you? Don't, don't look for the blessings, look for the opposition. You want proof that God called you? Look for all the pain that you have to endure as you're walking out your salvation. You see, somewhere in the, in the, down the line of, of, of Christianity, maybe in America, we got it into our mind that, 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 that the proof of God's being with us is blessings and, and rosy patches and, and easy roads. But the reality is the proof that God is for you is the fact that you're suffering persecution. It's the fact that you're having to fight through some things every single day of your life. Don't stop praying that silly prayer. Oh God, when, when I find it, when you, when you finally bless me, everything in my life is going to be so swell and so neat and so cute. Baby, I've got news for you. If you're going to do anything effective for God, there is always going to be opposition in your life. There is always going to be an enemy at every turn and at every corner trying to deceive you. Pastor, that's not good news. Oh, no, I didn't finish yet. The good news is that every devil has already been defeated. The good news is that, the, huh, can I say it again? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've got power to overcome temptation. You've got power to overcome all the enemy is throwing your way. Your opposition is proof of your calling. You're anointed, and because you're anointed, the enemy's fighting against you. You're anointed. That's why you've got all those feelings and those thoughts running through your head. You're anointed. That's why you feel inadequate. You're anointed. That's why the enemy is throwing all this self-doubt at you. Uh-huh. You're anointed. You're anointed. You're anointed. But you got to get it into your mind. If I'm anointed, if I'm anointed to go through the great door, then I'm also anointed for the warfare that has to come before I go through the door. God has anointed me to knock every giant down, to tear down every mountain that is in front of me. I want to let you know this morning you've been anointed for warfare. And yes, the enemy is going to oppose you. And yes, thoughts of suicide and thoughts of depression and thoughts of my life would be so much better if this, that, and the other are going to creep up every once in a while. But remind yourself, this is opposition. There's a great door in front of me. And I will not be a people pleaser, even if it means not pleasing myself. Help me, Holy Ghost. God, I don't even want to please myself. God, I've got one aim and one mission in this life, and that's to please you. That's to honor you. That's to lift up your name. Ooh, you thought that people pleasing just had to do with everybody else. Sometimes the person that is causing you to want to please the most is you yourself. And you got to look at self some days and say, self, you will not self-sabotage. You, you will not keep me from becoming everything that God has called me to be. You've got to talk to yourself some days. 
Forget about everybody else. I got to talk to me. I won't please myself. I won't please my flesh. No, 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 no. There's a great door that's been opened for me. And I won't be trapped between my opinion and God's. Because God's opinion is the only one that matters, everybody. It's the only one that matters. You see, Satan, I want you to know this, Satan only opposes what opposes him. (laughs) If he ain't opposing you, that's because you ain't fighting against him. And if he is opposing you, that means that you're something in your life. You're something in your life that brings the glory of God. That is bringing forth the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And because there's something in your life like that, Satan's going, I'm going to fight you every single day. I'm going to try to knock you into depression. I'm going to try to knock you out. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to mess your life up as much as I can to the point where you say, you know what? I can't handle this no more. If you have been at that place right there where the pressure has become so great, you say, I can't handle this. You are at a great place in your life. At that moment, drop it, put it at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm casting my cares upon you because I can't carry these burdens for myself. Again, Satan only opposes what opposes him. I want to say this. I want to say this. It's so important because I have a lot of Christians say, I want victory. I want victory. I want victory. I want victory. Well, you can't have victory if you won't engage in warfare. You can't have victory. Well, pastor, I want to walk in the power that you walk in. or I want to walk in the power that so-and-so walks in. And I want to walk in that victory. I want to walk in that victory. Are you willing to go through the, vic- through the, through the warfare that those people are going through? Are you willing to allow your life? Come on, somebody. Are you willing to go and fight every single day in order to get? That person did did not just anoint it because God decided to bless them more than he blesses you. That person is walking in the power and dripping in the presence of God because even in their tough days, they've learned how to lay out before the Lord, to lay on their face and say, God, I know it was a rough day, but it is your day. And this is the day the Lord has made, so I will rejoice and be glad in the midst of it. They have learned how how to worship God in pain. They have learned how to pursue God beyond their own personal desires. And now they're walking in a power because they were willing to engage in warfare. And what I find right now, especially in this hour that we are in, the enemy is sending distraction. Many of you caught a glimpse of the glory of God and the purpose of God for your life in the early part of this year. And the enemy is trying to use this space in time to get you to start becoming so distracted. Help me, Holy Ghost. To get you to get so overwhelmed by the opposition that is in your life and that you're facing right now that some of you are thinking about giving up and quitting on Jesus because this thing ain't working fast enough. I've got news for you. This is not the time for you to please yourself and to please anybody else around you. This is the time for you to stay focused. This is the time for you to engage in warfare because without warfare, there is no victory. I want to tell you this. When it comes to opposition, God's favor outweighs all opposition. Can I say that again? God's favor, it outweighs all opposition. People, they can reject you. They can call you out your name. They can threaten to harm you. But I want to tell you this, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. I need you to hear me. When you're walking in step with God for your life, I'm not going to say that people ain't going to say things about you and ain't going to hurt you. I'm not going to say that people won't do things to you that won't hurt you. I'm going to tell you that sometimes life is just going to happen. It won't even be people, Sister Robin. It's just going to be life. Life happens. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. And sometimes we just got to go through our fair share of things in life. But here's what I know. I know no matter what comes into my life, I always end up on top. Not because of me, but because of the one who lives inside of me. If that's your testimony, why don't you give God some praise right there? I'm getting ready to finish up this message, but can we just give God a a quick little praise break? God, I'm so grateful that when opposition came my way, opposition where the, the weapons of my enemies were able to form, but they were never able to prosper against me. They said what they said. They made false accusations against you. Said things that were completely untrue. They told you you were going to be nothing. You ain't gonna, you're going to end up just like your mom and your dad. You're going to be a mess like everybody in your family. They declared every negative thing they could have ever said against you. But somehow, by the grace of God, you are still standing. You are still strong. You are still here. Why? Because when God opens a door, 
No man's words, no man's false accusations, no man's, you know, listen, you can, they can try to put their hands on you, but nothing can ever close a door that God opens. Let me tell you this. There's only one thing really that can keep that door from being effective. And it would have been Paul's inability to stay planted where God put him. I need to preach to somebody. You need to stay planted in the word of God. You need to stay planted in the things of God. You need to stay planted in the church of God. This is not the time for you to try to find yourself outside of God. You've tried that long enough and it never works. I want to declare to you, this is the moment that you stand in the door that God has opened up wide for you. You don't go back to Corinth. You don't go back to Corinth, Paul. You stay at Ephesus because although there is opposition there, there is a way that has been made by God. Although there is struggles right where you're planted. See, some of you are like, I don't want to stay because it's harder to stay planted in this thing. Let me tell you, the opposition is real. There is trouble here, but the same God who brought you to the door is standing with you in that space and he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And I'll tell you this, I'd rather walk with God into a battle than walk somewhere into some rosy place without him. Because I know this, if God be for me, who could ever be against me? If God be for you, who could ever be against you? And this is not the time to go back to Ephesus. Paul, Stay. Rather, it's not the time to go back to Corinth. This is the time to stay in Ephesus. This is the time to preach the gospel. If I had some time, I'm already over my time, but if I had some time, I would have told you why Ephesus was important. Ephesus was important because it was, to some degree, the center of popular culture. There were a lot of things that were going on in the world at Ephesus. I would liken it to like a New York City. It was an area, it was a city that had great influence. And what, what, what everyone else in Corinth didn't understand was that if Paul's life and his ministry, if Paul's life and his ministry were ever going to come to the full level of maturity, that Paul couldn't be stuck in Corinth. That he had to be able to get into a place where the message of Christ could go out even further. So God strategically puts Paul in Ephesus. He wasn't even planning on going there. He was passing through there, but he stops in Ephesus and God says, I'm going to open a door here. Yes, there's going to be opposition. Yes, there's going to be people that want to get rid of you and kill you, Paul. But Paul, if you can preach the gospel here, and if, so, if, it, can, if it can catch like a virus, then I believe it'll spread all through Ephesus. And if it spreads in Ephesus, then it will spread all around the entire world. I want you to understand that the door that you think that God has put before you may seem insignificant. It might not make much sense to you, but I know this about our God. He's strategic in everything that he does. There is something about the door that God has called you to that he says, I'm going to use it for my glory. Don't you dare go back to Corinth. Stay in Ephesus. Work out your salvation with God. Keep doing what he's called you to do. And I'm telling you, in time, you'll see the effects of your decision. You see, if Paul didn't stay at Ephesus, there will be no, there will be no book of Ephesians. There will be no Ephesians 6, y'all. <laughs> Talking to us about war, spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God. If Paul didn't stay at Ephesus, I, I, I can venture to say that maybe the gospel message wouldn't have been able to spread out into the world the way that it is. There's a, there's, what I'm saying, church, is there's a reason where God has you, why God has you planted where he has you planted. There's a reason why you're at the job that you're at. There's a reason why the Lord put you in the neighborhood you're in. There's a reason why God put you in the church that you're in. There's a reason why God gave you the influence that he gave you. Why? Because he wants to do a great and effective work for his kingdom, but he wants to do it through you. So don't you be distracted, pastor. Don't you be distracted in this season where your seats are empty. I'm preaching to pastors now. Don't you be distracted by the fact that your building may not be as full or might not even be open. Don't you be distracted. Don't you think that God has missed the mark. Don't you leave the door in Ephesus for a door in Corinth. If God brought you to Ephesus and opened the door, then he will finish what he started in your life. He will do everything that he promised he was going to do. Oh, come on, church of the living God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I believe that journey is on its way to better days. 
I believe that this is, oh, yes, this has been challenging. And yes, we've got a few people in the room and the rest of y'all watch it online. And as a pastor, as a natural man, it grieves my heart some days. But oh, in my spirit, man, I am convinced more than I have ever been convinced that God is for us. And if God be for us, who could ever be against us? So I'm not leaving this door. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm not leaving this door. I'm going to remain faithful at the door that has been opened to me, and I'm going to trust that the God who called me to it will give me the grace to go through this season. And when we get on the other side, we're going to see that the sufferings that we've endured are nothing to be compared (laughs) to the glory which shall be revealed in us later. That's what Paul says. He says it in the book of Romans. He says, you know what? The sufferings that we're going through, none of them can be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us later. I'm going to let you go with this word. Hang on in there until later. Hang on in there until you can see your later. Don't give up right now in the presence of, uh, of trouble and trial and distractions and oppositions. But if you hang in there, Eventually, later is going to come, and the glory you're going to see later is greater than any glory you have ever seen before. I'll declare this over this house and every church around the world, that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former house. Oh, come on, somebody. The the, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. We're going to see the presence and the manifestation of God like we've never seen it before. We're believing God for that and trusting him in it. Regardless to how difficult the distractions and the opposition is in your life, don't you leave your open door. Mm -mm. Alex, don't you leave your open door. Robin, don't you leave your open door. Rose, don't you leave your open door. I know you're in the middle of a fight, but don't you leave your open door. There's a blessing on the other side of that. That once you're done doing all your fighting and having to endure all the warfare, it's going to be so worth it. So what do I do with the distractions? Do the same thing Paul did. Same thing Paul did in verse eight. He says, I'm staying in Ephesus. Tell your distractions. I'm staying in Ephesus. I'm staying at the door. What do I do with the opposition? The same thing Paul does in verse 8. He says, I'm staying in Ephesus. Tell the opposition, it doesn't matter how much you oppose me, it doesn't matter how much you hate me, God sent me here. And because He sent me here, I'm going to do everything He's called me to do. I'm staying in Ephesus. Why? Because there's too much work to be done. There's too many souls that need to be reached. There's too many lives that need to be transformed. This week, I was asked by a pastor, how are you hanging, how are you staying strong through this? This pastor was a little overwhelmed. His church was really suffering right now. And um, he just was talking about quitting. And giving up and throwing in the towel. And I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I'm done. I'm, I'm just over it. And he said something to me in the conversation. He said, aren't you frustrated? Aren't you frustrated with the fact that you feel like all your years of work has fallen apart? And it's gone down the drain. And I thought about what he said because I, you know, I didn't consider it until he said it. And I said, you know what, brother? I can't say I have. I'm not going to say it won't, the temptation won't come up in the future, but I can't say I have. And I said, here's how I think I'm, why the Lord has given me the grace to go through this season. Let me tell you why. Because I'm not looking about what I did. I'm not looking back at what I did or what we accomplished. I'm looking forward to what still needs to be accomplished. <laughs> did you hear me, somebody? You got to stop looking back to find something to give you motivation. 
and start looking forward and say, you know what? Thank God for what he did in the past, but I'm not concerned about the past. I'll praise him for it, but my eyes are fixed to the future. Laying all those things aside, Paul said, I press forward to the mark of a high calling that can only be found in Christ Jesus. And I'm not looking at this season and saying, oh my God, I've lost so much. I'm looking at this season and saying there's still so much more work that needs to be done. There is an open door. And I'll keep walking through the door. So church, there's too much work to be done in the future for you to get caught up in what you lost in the past. There's a door in front of you and it has been wide, made wide open by God. Your assignment in this season is to not please people, is to not please yourself. Your assignment in this season is not to run away from opposition. But your assignment in this season is to walk through the door and to do the work that God called you to do, the work that will advance his kingdom, the work that will make Jesus proud, even if it doesn't make you known. I'll say that again. The work that will make Jesus proud, even if it doesn't make you known. Would you bow your heads with me, whether you're in your living room, at the beach, or in the auditorium right now? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for every open door represented in this room. God, you've been so good to us to even open a door for us. And God, throughout the stages of our life, there have been times where we've run from open doors because the distractions were too much and the opposition was too great. But God, in this moment, as we stand before open, an open door, give us the courage to stand and be faithful. Give us the strength to stand and be faithful to you in this hour. Lord, there are so many things trying to pull us in this direction and in that direction, but would you help us to prioritize what is most important over the lesser important things in life? Lord, so many of my brothers and sisters are distracted. So many of my brothers and sisters are experiencing great opposition. And Father, right now, I pray for supernatural strength for every single one of them. God, give them strength to be able to pursue you in the midst of opposition. Give them clarity of mind so that they won't be moved in any other direction but the one that you have called them to. And Father, we know that behind the opening of this door, there are great blessings, there is a great work, and there is great warfare. But Father, we know that behind this door, most importantly, is you. And if you be for us, who could ever be against us? In Jesus' name.